Earth and mapped the paths of the planets as ellipses, uh, not as circles. On this basis, then, they were able to make predictions. Predictions of where the planets would appear at certain dates and so forth, and lo and behold, these predictions, these predictions worked. Um, another example is uh, the Greeks, the natural philosophers, uh, considered it self-evident that heavier objects would fall faster uh, than lighter objects. And for thousands and thousands of years, uh, conclusions were deduced on the movement of objects through space uh, on the basis of this first principle, that heavier falls faster uh, than lighter. Uh, Galileo used this revolutionary method, this new method of experimenting, testing, looking for evidence, trying to gather data, not just arguing about it from first principles, not using uh, deduction and, 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 and using logic, uh, but actually using experiments. And, and of course, he famously demonstrated that the uh, freely falling bodies move at the same rate, regardless of weight. Uh, following Aristotle, it was thought for centuries that men had more teeth than women. Every educated schoolchild knew that men had more teeth than women. It, it wasn't until three, three or four hundred years ago that somebody actually thought to look and, and to count to see whether or not uh, it, it was the case. It, this method was just not deployed. The empirical methods were, were not deployed at that time. Another very important move that was made from the, the drift, the, the change from natural philosophy to what we now call science, is the deployment of mathematics and geometry. Until that point, the natural philosophers conducted themselves in natural language. They conducted themselves in whatever their native tongue, whatever the language of their native tongue was, or in one of the educated, European, you know, educated, Latin, uh, educated languages, Latin or, or Greek. The deployment of mathematics and geometry was, again, controversial. There were great arguments between Newton, who used geometry, and Leibniz, who used mathematics. But these formal languages, the shift from an informal natural language as the language of natural philosophy stroke science, the shift from that to formal languages such as geometry and mathematics uh, was also enormously important. So through this period then, um, beginning around 1500 in Europe and ex you know, extending through the centuries, we see enormous gains in knowledge. Newtonian me mechanics, um, Darwinian theories of evolution, and, and, and so forth. The whole sort of, you know, the, the, the edifice of the, the scientific instruments here that surround us, the fact that we're able to make these computers that work and these screens, and we're able to podcast this lecture. Uh, doing, doing all of these kinds of things um, is said to that that progress is said to go back to this idea of empiricism, induction, experimentation, and hypothesis testing. Now, come forward a little more, and I'll give you the uh, an illustration of a quintessential scientific group as differentiated from the natural scientists. This group are the logical positivists. The logical positivists, or sometimes called the logical empiricists, because 
that they were very much empirical uh, in, in their approach, uh, were an early form of scientific realist, and I'll come in, in a, I won't get there today, but we'll come in another lecture to talk about scientific realism. They were most influential uh, in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, most of them lived in and around uh, Vienna. From 1920, from in the 1920s you know, or, or thereabouts, logical positivism was the epitome of a scientific approach. Logical positivism purified, characterised this new scientific approach. And they were influential uh, through to the 1950s and 1960s. Now, I, th I, I think that they're still influential. I think logical positivism can be seen in, science, in contemporary scientific realism. Um, and a, a lot of the language that we use in, uh, when we try to apply scientific methods uh, comes from the logical positivists. Um, however, their, their star was setting by the 1950s and 1960s. The logical positivists were very rigorous in their empiricism. They had no time whatsoever for interpretive work, they had no time for imaginative work, no time for theorising that was not based on evidence, not based on observation. Their view was that the scientist was a modest witness. This term was used. The scientist was very modest and simply witnessed nature. And it was nature that spoke. It was nature that told the truth. And the modest witness's job is simply to listen. That's what, that, that was the scientist's job. Science doesn't answer the questions. Nature answers the questions, not the scientist, according to the logical positivist. Atoms answer questions. Rocks answer questions. Plants answer questions. The sun, in its behaviour, answers questions, not the people who are studying these things. The facts about the sun are known to the sun and are available to humans only through the most careful observation of the sun. The scientist's job is to be objective and disinterested. The sun holds the truth after all, so all one need do is objectively listen to fairly and accurately and objectively report what the sun is telling us what this plant is telling us, what the rock is telling us, what the atom is telling us. The scientist must not go one inch further than what nature tells the scientist, nor stop short one inch. The positivists, interestingly, paid very little attention to what scientists actually did they weren't interested in what actually happened in the laboratory or out in the test planting fields. That, that wasn't of interest um, to them at all. That was what they called the context of discovery. That was what happened around the deep, uh, uh, you know, through the process of listening to nature. What they were more interested in is the context of justification. Not the context of discovery, but the context of justification. So when someone comes up with a formula for benzene by dreaming of a snake swallowing its tail, or when someone comes up with the, the shape of DNA uh, by uh, dreaming and imagining a twisted uh, double helix, this sort of conjecturing, dreaming, imagining, etc., etc., is irrelevant so far as the logical positivist is concerned. What the logical positivist is concerned with.